Brown, welcome to B Cube Sunday morning. And uh, we are pleased to have Jim Wright and David Gerald. Now, David is sitting uh, uh, at his computer. I don't know exactly what, but I bet he's uh, he's working on some technical difficulties because I can see the screen. Uh, uh oh, he's here. Now, there he is. I really want to see a cool graphic that shows you pounding on the top of your computer monitor with an anvil or something. Okay. That's your, that's the, a good out of service mode. Uh, now, uh, for those of you who, who, who just love to watch the show, watch us go through our pregame ritual. David, can you hear me? Okay. Has say something so I can tell if I can hear you. Okay, looks like Jim, you have got control of the microphone. I have got well, what the hell does that mean? That means that you, uh, David's microphone isn't working, and it's either people can listen to you talk or me oh, talk. Oh, I see. I, I got you. I was gonna say, control the microphone, dude. You're the editor, man. You're the guy running this podcast. I got control well, of nothing. Then you know you're right. I do love running this podcast because I got to tell everybody it is Happy Easter out there, and I would encourage everybody who needs to enjoy Easter to go. If you're going to ever celebrate Zombie Jesus, uh, go back and look at the. Uh, you can hear me now, right? There he is. Hey, there he is. All right. Oh, he saved you, Jim. Oh, that's you know, all right. That's one thing. A lot of folks who know me have, have uh, learned that never, never encouraged me to talk. Because uh, I was about to send you off to reference you to Matthew 5 through 7 and go read the Sermon on the Mount oh, and, uh, and say, now there are some good things in that book that are worth reading, even if the, the salesman doesn't know what's in it. I hey listen, okay, the salesman. Hey, are we are we really really Bob? Really, I mean, we're going to start out this morning talking about the Trump Bible, and uh, this is a guy that was selling big gaudy gold shoes last week. But you know, it's like I said, I think I said this online for those of you who follow me. And I mean, you look at this guy, right? Anyways, this guy's been running a scam for I don't know as long as we've known him, decades now. You know, it was Trump stakes and Trump water and. Trump Airlines and Trump sports team and Trump this and Trump vodka and Trump that. Last week, last month, he was selling big, gaudy, gold-plated shoes with his face on it. This week no. And that's what happens. No. Sooner or later, every failed conman hits on religion. And that's where the money's at, man. You know, sooner or later... Sooner or later, they figure out that's that's how you make a profit, man. You you start selling, you start selling Bibles, you start selling Jesus. That, you know. Well, there is one thing: his Bibles, I, and I don't know how how good they are. I'm certainly not going to invest, but they do include they do include yeah they do include copies of the Constitution. So maybe some of his followers will actually get a chance to read the Constitution and the yeah. and. Uh, uh, and get some understanding because it's clear that they don't. Um, uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, people who impressed me with his stupidity said the freedom of the speech is and freedom of the press is only for Christians. It's like uh, no, but uh, thanks for playing and pick up one of our board games on the way out. <laughs> My favorite is it's, it's got the it's got the uh, Declaration of Independence in it apparently too and. Uh... This might be the first time any of those people have actually read anything beyond the preamble, you know, that first paragraph, you know, in the course of human events. But you actually get to you actually get to the the thirty something complaints that they had. That's uh, pretty eye opening. If you go down those one by one and you uh, and, and you look at where uh, you look at who's doing what nowadays, you could substitute the word Republican in for. Uh, for King George and uh, not really have to change any other the rest of the wording. Well, anyway, I, I, I yeah, don't want to sound. We're on it this morning. I don't want to sound to... overconfident, but uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, YouTube and other commenter commentators who are 
pointing out all the different things that are working against uh, Deadbeat Donnie. And <laughs> so um, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit optimistic, particularly the fact that uh, uh, Joe Biden is out uh, uh, raising him in cash or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, I, what I had been enjoying was the uh, fact that most of the mega donors on the Republican side were just had decided to sit this one out. Now it looks like some of them are coming back to support deadbeat Donnie, even though the evidence is there that the economy always does better under a Democratic president. But uh, uh, you would think that some of those billionaires who are so interested in corporate profits would understand that. But uh, apparently they'd rather have tax cuts than a, a, a healthy economy. Well, but again, you're, yeah. you're you're looking at. I mean, and you're absolutely correct as usual, um, which is really annoying. But uh, um, the thing is, is that uh, it, it's a cult. I mean, these these people can look directly at this. I mean, I, I don't know how many times we've gone over this now. Uh, inflation is the perfect example, right? The cost of goods have gone up, but inflation is down unemployment is down the economy is booming all the all the same things that republicans used as a measure of a booming economy four years ago are almost an order of magnitude better today than they were when trump was in office but somehow those things are indicators of a bad economy now well, yeah, Trump is talking about how our economy is in the toilet and the this and the that. It's like, and the numbers don't, as the guy is totally disassociated because it's he's interested in creating the illusion of we're in a national disaster and he's going to fix it. But, you know, the evidence of 2016 um, and and his four years in office, uh, he didn't fix anything. He's in a history of broken promises, no wall. Uh, no health care plan, no infrastructure. No, he promised he was going to reduce the national debt. Instead, he raised it sixteen trillion dollars. It's like, it, it, which is an un unthinkable number. I mean, I can't even think of a million over here, let alone a, a billion or a trillion. So, I mean, he's got a history of broken promises. Why anybody would vote for? They're not voting for uh, uh, his policy. They're voting for who he promises to hurt, that's and right. that's what some of his followers have said, well, he hurt the wrong people, so I'm not going to vote for him this time. But there's still the great majority of them still want to hurt those people who are hurting them. And that's really right. not where you go with, I mean, that's just not a sane position. Well, and you're, I, I, you know, again, absolutely correct. I mean, I live amongst these people. I live in, in, in the Panhandle of Florida, which is Trump Central. In fact, David was just here. He just spent a, just spent a week in my guest room. And uh, um. It wasn't that. It only seemed like a week. <laughs> it only seemed like a week. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, we had a great time, man. We we had a great time. But this is this is this is Trump land. These are these are people who who repeatedly reelect Matt Gates, who's done absolutely nothing for them. In fact, the safest place to be, if you're a 17 year old girl, the safest place to be is in Matt Gates district because he's never here, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, and uh, the thing about it, though, is the fact that that these people keep voting for them. And they've got signs in their yard to say, keep Matt working for you. Matt, I ask these people, what has he, he done for you? I mean, give me a list. He hasn't even renamed a post office. The, the, the last thing that this guy did was claim that he wanted to rename the Navarre Beach Bridge after Donald Trump. They're going to tear that bitch down here in a couple of years and build a new one. So, uh, and he didn't actually do anything. I mean, there wasn't actually any legislation. The guy hasn't done shit. He hasn't done anything. What's he done for you? And the answer is he makes you mad. And that's, that has become the operating philosophy of these people. We don't give a shit how bad Trump is, how well, who he hurts. We don't care how high the deficit is. We don't care how many people die from a, a preventable disease. As long as you're mad, as long as he hurts you, as long as he makes you angry, that's all that matters to us. They're small, mean, petty, shitty little people. One of you would have been pushed to the goddamn fringe with their crappy message and their shitty attitude. And now they're mainstream. This is literally the operating philosophy of the Republican Party. We don't care as long as it makes you mad. 
And that's that's what's happened. And, and this is the religion that I'm surrounded. These pious assholes are all down at the church this morning. And, the, and, and the, message, the message isn't one of peace and love and forgiveness and resurrection and eternal life and all that kind of stuff. If you believe in that, great, good for you. It's 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 getting even. It's getting revenge. It's, it's balancing the goddamn books. They impeach Trump. We got to impeach Biden. That's how it is. That's what equality means to them. Well, that's you know, that's why they. Uh, guy, we're coming after your guy. That's why they impeached Bill Clinton. Uh, they wanted to get even for the impeachment of Richard Nixon. There's no there's eye for an eye. They read this goddamn passage wrong. You know, and the, the Bible uh, uh, is telling you eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Those are bad things. No, 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 no. Way, you got to go out. Papa's on the teeth. Papa's on the phone. Papa's on the phone. And instead of taking that as the, the lesson, the way that it, it was meant, what? Sorry did, about that exit. They, I had a uh, grandchild come into yeah, my room. I'm hoping mine arrives here any minute now. That's, that's, I'm, I'm on my, my, um, they, they literally turned an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth into their operating philosophy. We've got to get even. These are people that are still angry about the Bay of Pigs 70 years ago. They're still mad about the Iranian hostage crisis, which is goddamn 40 something years ago now. I'm so mad about this. They touched our stuff. We got to get even with these people. We got to get even with them. There's there's no peace. We can't. The, the things that, that defeated communism, for example, warships and bombs and invisible bombers from the sky didn't defeat the Soviet Union. What defeated the Soviet Union was Pizza Hut and Levi's. And you look at communism in places, and communism for God's sake, communism in places like Cuba, and they're they're mad about that. But goddamn, we got to get even with those guys. And yet, the obvious answer to how you defeat them is not by isolating them and 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 validating everything that their their communist leaders have been telling them about how horrible we are. The way you defeat them is the same way we defeated the Soviet Union. Capitalism. You trade with these people. You know the worst thing that ever happened to Chinese communism? Hong Kong. When the British gave Hong Kong back to the Chinese, because I was there when that happened. When the Chinese people saw what it was like, everybody from the current generation, they don't want to be wandering around in a goddamn turnip field wearing pajamas all day. Communists, if you got to be kidding me, what they want are BMWs and Rolexes, like everybody else. I was, else. Uh, okay. I, was uh, I was in, uh, I was in Hong Kong in 2007, and I was chatting with uh, a filmmaker there, and I asked her what happened with communism, and she says, "Oh, we don't do that anymore. It doesn't work." <laughs> and this, yeah, we, we were in Hong Kong, but we went to uh, Shenzhen and. Uh, uh, Shilong and a couple other places, and uh, uh, everybody was more interested in making money than they were in uh, uh, communism. You don't defeat communism by dropping bombs on it. You defeat communism by living up to the principles that you claim are superior to everybody. This this idea of Western, like I said, there isn't a person under thirty in China that gives a shit about communism. They want what we got. They want 900 channels of, of streaming TV, and they want fast food, and they want Rolexes and BMWs, and 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 they want McDonald's, man. That's what they want. And, and now I gotta and, tell you, I gotta tell you, the Chinese economy is staggering, and the reason why is because the Chinese government is still trying to manage things with a very heavy authoritarian hand, and uh, an economy works best when when you loosen the regulations enough that people can accomplish what they set out to do. But the Chinese government is, is, is trying to micromanage and that works against any economy. That's what killed the Soviet Union. The Communist Party was another level of bureaucracy that was draining the resources of the country. Um, and uh, the country was functioning one step away from bankruptcy. Uh, and in the 90s, they couldn't keep up with American military expansion and, and that's what collapsed them. Uh, they uh, they were trying to invest in their military expansion on the same level as the United States, and they couldn't. 
They didn't have the infrastructure. They didn't have the resilience. So, um, well, and again, I'll right. tell you though, I was thinking about this the other day, and, and uh, one of the, the things, the ironic things about this situation is that, uh, and again, I, I mentioned communism this morning because it's in my full of it, and uh, you know, people are mad. mad. We got to talk about con communism. We've got God's sake, we talk about communism, crying out like it's 1950 or something. But I will tell you, the single best thing that ever happened to capitalism, especially Western capitalism, is communism. Best thing in the whole world. The Walton family wouldn't be the wealthiest family in the world without communism. The Elon Musk wouldn't be the richest guy in the world without communism. These people all claim they hate communism. They hate communism, but goddamn, do they love that cheap ass communist labor? You can't buy a pair of fruit of the looms in this country that wasn't made in communist Vietnam. All right. They they love they love capitalism so much, but they sure as hell don't love don't love American workers. They don't love paying a living wage. They don't love the idea of of CEOs and workers being on the plane. They really love the idea of CEOs making four hundred to five hundred times what a worker on the line makes, especially if that worker happens to be some peasant in Xinjiang, China, cranking out widgets. Because they yeah, most of the uh, most of the other countries, the uh, the CEOs are making only fifty times what the workers on the, the lowest paid workers are getting here in the United States. The uh, CEOs are making almost five hundred times what the lowest paid workers are making. That is an imbalance that uh, anyone who doesn't understand the problem there should study up on the French Revolution when the aristocrats were so out of. So, so out of touch with what the peasants were doing the, that uh, they the revolution caught them totally by surprise. They were oh, just yeah. that out of touch. They were living in, del in delusion land. Yeah, we were just, in fact, we were, I was just talking to somebody about this uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. I mean, you, you, what happens, and this is, this, is, this is how everything goes sideways for everybody all the time. When you, when you wind up in this situation where the people who actually do the labor are the ones that get shit on all the time, and the, the folks that own everything are living in, you know, they're, they're living in the, the winter palace on top of the goddamn mountain. Uh, like the like the czars were. What happens is eventually you get the French Revolution. You get the communist revolution in in Russia. And what happens is, is people rise up and burn the goddamn government to the ground. But then you don't get, and, and there, there will be a wise guy come along, and he'll he'll have some great phrase. And you know, communism really has this great uh, this great uh, sales line, you know, to to everybody uh, according to their needs, you know, and yada yada yada. Everybody's going to be equal. We're not going to have any rich assholes living in a palace, ordering everybody to fight and die in uh, you know in some goddamn war somewhere. But what always happens, always. Is that once that revolution comes and you throw those and you drag those people out of their castles or their Trump towers and you hang their ass from the lamppost, what you get is communism, or you get Adolf Hitler, you get fascism, you get the spectrum, you get fascism, you get the extremes on either end, and then you get eighty or ninety years of goddamn suffering. Whenever those revolutions come and you burn the country down, you never get better, at least not for a long goddamn time. All you do is replace one set of assholes with another one. And that's what these people can't seem to see in this country, as a fact that, that the rich keep getting richer and the, 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 the middle class keeps getting smaller. And there's a threshold where all of that explodes in your face. And you're not going to get, and this is the problem with the extreme left, the people that are filling my goddamn feeds with, burn it all down. Arson. People dying of fire. Burning the building down isn't going to improve anybody's lives. And so what you wind up with is disaster. You wind up with the Soviet Union. You wind up with communist China. You wind up with the revolution in Cuba. You wind up with goddamn Nazis taking over. This is what happens every time. And but you can't, you reach a point, and we're, we're damn close to it now, where you can't make people see that. Because extremism looks good to them. Because that's the, 
that's the that's the constant message that they're hammered with. And you see, half of this country right now, half of this country right now thinks that they're they're living in the Great Depression or some kind of horrible poverty, some terrible oppression. You get people around me that do nothing but talk about how Christians are oppressed in this country. I mean, Christians are oppressed in this country. There's a goddamn Christian church on every freaking corner. People wandering around with symbols of Christianity. You know, part of the problem to these people. You know? All right, Jim, Jim, chill for a minute. Part of the problem is this belief that we are the most advanced country in the world. And I got to tell you, these people don't travel because if they've been to China or they've been to Paris or they've been to uh, almost any other country, they would see uh, trains that work. They would see people with, uh, I was in uh, Hong Kong in uh, 2005, 2006. And everywhere I went, people had the flat screen monitors on their computers. And I got back to the States and every everybody here was using CRTs. We didn't start getting flat screen monitors until two years later. I said, I've seen the future. It's flat screen monitors. And when I was in Hong Kong, I had a phone that could make video calls. This was 2005. And it, it wasn't until like three, four, five years later that the first video calls were possible on your phone or on your monitor. And uh, the future is we are not the most advanced country in the world anymore. Uh, you can see it in London. You can see it in Paris. You can see it in Rome. You can see it all over the world, but especially in China, where they are putting their tech to work a lot faster than we are. So the And their trains, I got to tell you, I would l rather be on that. The Chinese trains were magnificent. And uh, I haven't been to Japan except their airport, so I can't say anything about Japan. But if the pictures I've seen... It's like, and, and some of the other countries, you see the videos on YouTube of what's being built all over the world. And you say, why can't we have that here in the United States? And the reason why we can't is because some asshole sitting in the corporate boardroom says it's not cost effective. I'm not going to make enough money off of it. Right. And so we're not getting better planes and we're not getting better trains and we're not building, rebuilding our infrastructure because somebody somewhere says, oh, I don't want to pay the taxes for that. Right. Well, and, and, and again, and you also have this like we've, we've developed in the last couple of years and the last maybe 10 years. Yeah, and I see the comments. Jack, I, I'm not even on caffeine. This is my first cup of coffee today. I just rode 20 miles on a bike. That's why I'm amped up. Settle down, you jackasses. At the, um, at, look, look, if I, if, I need to be, if I need to be harassed, I'm married. I have a wife that will do it for free. I don't need you people. But uh, all right, anyway, uh, but again, in the last 10 years, we've developed this, and especially recently, there's half the country has developed this reflexive contrarianism. It doesn't matter what the hell. The anti-vax movement is a perfect example. We literally, we, we, you literally went from people who were suspicious of the COVID vaccine for no goddamn reason that makes any sense to now rejecting. We have outbreaks of measles in this country measles like it's 1954 some goddamn thing. there are people there are children dying of whooping cough in this country the hell is that? does he actually have active cases of polio and you literally have people that are on the internet and i i'm looking at it i, I have actually have i i i decided i would uh i would open with violence this morning and so i wish twitter a happy uh, transgender day of uh, visibility, and uh, so I'm watching that happen on my uh, my Twitter feed over here on the screen to your left. And uh, uh, you, you have simply outraged by everything. They're outraged by vaccines. They're outraged by the idea of public transportation. I was watching a video uh, yesterday of uh, bicycle intersection in uh, in in, uh, in the Netherlands, and. Uh, for uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch road engineers, uh, assign traffic signals to some of them to deliberately build their intersections so that it requires everybody to slow down. And, and, and in most of the country, if you've ever driven in Holland, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, or if you've ever, ever ridden a bike, it's a very bike oriented culture. It's a great place for someone like me who rides a bike 20 miles every day. Um, and all I can think of was the absolute carnage if you tried that in America. Because we're still at this intersection and there's bicycles oh, zooming through, that and sailing through the intersection without incident, without 
right side, and all I could see was four giant monster trucks slamming into each other with people shooting their guns out the window because there's no way in hell you do that in America. Because we can't think of that. I mean, culturally, we've become in the last 20 years, culturally, and I would say it began, it probably began before this, but it really began to gain steam with Reagan of this selfish bullshit of me first. And they, God, man, all you got to do is look at I, I, all you got to do is look at a stop, a four-way stop, and people are outraged, absolutely furious at each other. When you go to those goddamn intersections where there's two uh, two lanes and there's a red light, and then the lanes merge after that, <laughs> holy fucking shit, man! You talk about rage, just. I got to be there first. I got to be the guy in front. And it's you just have people fighting it out. And that's America. And then you look at some somewhere like the Netherlands where people are like, come on in. And they're like zipper merging in. And everybody's happy. And there's like children waving. And it's like, I'm you know, I, I, part of this goes back, as you pointed out, it goes back to Ronald Reagan, who campaigned on the government is the problem. And that has been the Republican mantra for so long that they want to replace the government with, I don't know what they want to replace it with because they haven't revealed their plan, except uh, the Heritage Foundation has a 2025 project. Uh, and it's worth looking up because what they really want to do is get rid of the constitution. They've said so. Uh, they are one of the, at CPAC, one of the speakers said, welcome to the end of democracy because they believe democracy doesn't work. Now this goes all the way back to the 60s when I was uh, knew a, a woman who was in the John Birch Society and she was quoting from the blue book and the black book, democracy is mobocracy, we, we need a strong man. We, and she didn't say dictator, but it's like, it was like Mein Kampf had been translated into English. And uh, that's what they want. They want dictatorial rule where they can get rid of anybody who opposes them. And it is right there in their 2025 project. They're going to deport or put into camps anybody who they disagree with. Uh, where have we heard that before? Of course, I don't think that I think that there are enough liberals who own guns that that's not going to go very far. Uh, and in fact, there are enough blue states that's not going to go very far. But they're doing their best in Texas and and, and Florida, uh, as you know, to. Uh, uh, to erase all opposition to, to uh, with vote rigging and, and purging the rolls and all that crap. So uh, anyway, uh, somebody has, uh, oh, Bob Brown put up a, uh, a thing yeah, about yeah, right it. Yeah, I'm like, but, who the hell is uh, yeah. Oh, Bob. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but that, but the thing, thing is, is they have bred a, uh, they have bred a context of selfishness, road rage, fear, hatred, desperation, because it is easier to control a population if you make them angry. You cannot control a population as well by inspiring them. Because you can talk about the space program, and people say, well, what about, I, believe me, they said, what about trains? What about hunger? What about this, this? Yeah, we can do both, but they don't get inspired. It's hard to inspire people. It's a lot easier to make them mad. It only takes one person to start a fight, but it takes two people to make love. Well, okay. Yeah, uh, what you're talking about here, Chris. With that, but I think your analogy might be a little different. But anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, those of you who don't know, David uh, David spent a week uh, spent a week with me here uh, last month, and uh, here at the house, my wife loves him, and uh, we often have a very good time when uh, when he's down here for Pensacon, and uh, so uh, I. I uh, it, it was fun. We got to, I got to see some great places, a great, great um, uh, airplane museum. Great. Uh, that was, it was just, it was a, it was a necessary break after uh, three or four weeks of just driving or driving around and doing a lot of hard work. It was great. It was a great time. Yeah. A good time. David's talking about the, we went to the uh, National uh, Museum of Naval Aviation over at the uh, Pensacola Air Station. And, uh, but I have to be careful not to fall into inside jokes because we, we hang out so much that uh, yeah. And for those of you who don't know, um, we'll be at uh, both of us will be in uh, Montana here next month or what is it, next month? month after next. Yeah, I think it's May. I think it's May. I have to. I've spent. I have not. I have not checked my to-do list or my schedule for three days, and instead I've been writing. I will probably check it tomorrow morning and say, "Oh my God, look at all the stuff that I, the deadlines I missed." <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I did. that's what I've been doing. If you guys haven't seen me, I've been a little thin online lately. Yes, I've been writing this week. I've got a bunch of short stories, and uh, I'll uh, by our grandson this a couple times this week, and uh, he's an absolute joy. And so when I get to hang out with my uh, 16 month old grandson and set of you, oh, he's a treasure. He is just adorable. <laughs> he's he a is. Kid, so. Anyway, so we were off doing that kind of thing. But if you've seen that, if I've been a little thin lately, it's uh, it's, it's mostly because I've been working. I, 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 I uh, woke up with some ideas the other day and try to crack out some stories before we get to a Miss Con. And, uh, um, yeah, and we're making progress here. But I will say to you, um, I will say to you, folks, it's. Uh, my boss was coming. This hey, is come it. Here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Okay, you gotta come and get in. <laughs> Here, wait a minute, wave hello, wave hello, wave hello. There say you hi. go. Hey, you God, is that kid gorgeous hi, or what? How are you? <laughs> okay. Okay, buddy. We got a. Oh my God. Is, we're we're down to it here. This is the one where uh, you're gonna need to show up. You're gonna need to do your duty as a citizen. There isn't any way around it. You don't have the privilege or the luxury of not showing up anymore. And. Uh, uh, you know, and, and I would say that for the last couple of elections, you didn't have that privilege, but people thought they did. And now we're we're down to it, man. We are, you're you're literally every every single indicator that's coming from the opposition is is violence, is is fascist Germany, is 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 the worst aspects of of, dictator, of of every dictatorial example from history. You're seeing it. I mean, my God, yesterday, Trump is tweeting images of Biden shot in the head and tied up and thrown in the back of a pickup truck. That's what these people are thinking. I mean, you're literally looking at, at the Republican Party meeting in Texas, talking of women, giving women the death penalty for having an abortion or... Oh, yeah. They literally are talking about the death penalty. Putting women in the electric chair if they get in vitro fertilization. Now, I, you know, and, 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 and in fairness, you were warned. You know, I mean, the, 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 with fanatics, especially religious fanatics, but fanatics of any kind, whether they be ideological, political, religious, or whatever, there's never an end. There's never we're going to outlaw abortion and then that's it. You know, now we're all going to get along together. There's never going to be that because it's not about that. It's about raw, naked power and putting their boot on your goddamn throat. There's no, there's no accommodating this. You can't compromise with Nazis. You can't compromise with people who, who want to put your ass against the wall and put a bullet in you for living your damn life and, and so the founders of this country whatever their flaws and and there were plenty don't get me wrong but i don't idealize these people either but these people have just gone through a, a war and a revolution a violent revolution to change their political to change their their, their, their their political framework and so when they built the constitution they specifically built in a methodology of countering this sort of thing without killing each other and that process is you you got to show the hell up whether you want to or not whether you like the choices whether you're mad at joe biden about some goddamn war, some country on the other side of the world if you think those people got it and they do don't be wrong it's a bad all the way around i don't care which side of that conflict you think you're on I, I've been there, and I, I will tell you, yeah, it's bad. But whether or not you agree with this guy, the other side is putting your ass against the goddamn wall. You can't, you can't, you can't support the people that you claim that you care about in that war on that other side of the world, whatever war that happens to be, or those people that are marginalized. You say you care. About. Were those people starving in that country somewhere else? If your ass is, if you're living in a dictatorship and your ass is against the wall, you gotta show up now and, and stand against what's coming. Because if you don't, 
you're going to be the, you're going to be the people against the wall. Um, very well said, Jim. Uh, it's it's uh, I don't have a, uh, uh, a what puzzles me, and 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 somebody just made this comment. Why do they appear to be gaining so much ground with people of color, but also with the Latino community? And again, it is they are preying on the dissatisfaction. And, and I have said this more than once, and people don't get it. Um, you're not getting a pony. You're getting a plow horse at best. And you're not going to solve everything on day one. You're not going to solve everything in four years. What you're going to do is politics is a chess game. And you move as much as you can. You gain as much ground as you can. You put as much uh, changes. But you're, but, uh, for, and I'll give you an example. <clears throat> uh, Martin Luther King was very close to endorsing Richard Nixon for president in 1960. And uh, the, uh, Kennedy's approached him and said, we will do more for you. And he trusted them. And uh, he kept coming to the White House and he says, uh, you know, you got a promise to keep. JFK was killed and uh, Martin Luther King went to LBJ and said, here were the promises that you guys made to me. And LBJ said, I cannot pass uh, both this Voting Rights Act and, this, and the Civil Rights Act. I can pass one now and one later. And, and you're going to have to accept that because if I try to pass them both now, they, I'm not going to get them through Congress. So first they passed the Civil Rights Act. And then the following year, they passed the Voting Rights Act. And so Martin Luther King got both of the things that he wanted, but he couldn't get it all at once because it wasn't politically possible with the way Congress was set up. And there's a lot of things we would love to have in the, uh, uh, the government do. And the government is supposed to be a tool that does things for us that we can't do as individuals, but we're not going to be able to get it all because we've got 437 people who love to argue with each other. So what we can do is negotiate. Now, the Democrats are very, very good at negotiating with each other because there's no Democratic Party. There's a lot of coalitions under the Democratic Party, and they all negotiate with each other to, to come to terms on what they can pass. The Republicans are terrible at negotiation because they believe God is on their side. Therefore, they don't have to negotiate. Have to. They're right. The other side is all demons. The other side is all wrong. And the Republican, <clears throat> this is what we're seeing in Congress now, is empty green uh, wants to uh, get rid of uh, Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, which is fine with me, because he made a deal. He negotiated with the enemy. Well, yeah, sometimes you do negotiate with the enemy in order to make progress. And uh, this, is, this is what I think the voters have to realize is that you're not getting a pony. We already got enough horse poop to clean up. We, you're, the best you're going to get is a plow horse, and we're going to get the crops in for the, uh, the winter. That's what we have to do. But most of all, we have to keep the jackass out of the White House. Yeah, that's the thing. Like I said, all the stuff that people care about. I mean, I, and I get it. I mean, you've been here. You know what it's like. I, I, I get 10,000 messages a week from people. That, just tell me what they're they're worried about. They're worried about this. They're worried about that. They're worried about rights. This marginalized group, peace here, starvation there. All of those things that you claim that you care about. And I'm not saying you don't, but you claim you care about this, and then you tell me you're not going to show up because you didn't get whatever, or because you don't like the choices. Well, man, and you heard, and those who followed me for a long time know, and you've heard me say this again, adulthood is about making choices, whether you like it or not. I can't tell you how many times as a, an officer in the military, especially in conflict, you have to make a decision whether you like the options or you don't. And, and you, you have to. There, there's any way around it. You don't just say, well, I'm not going to do it. You have to do it. It's your duty. And the same thing is true of citizenship. There is a, there's, it is your duty. You have to make a damn decision. You have to show up. You have to do it anyway. I will also say to you that we wouldn't be in this situation if, if people had showed up, and, and I know I'm going to get angry email, we show up. Yeah, you do. But but statistically, half the country doesn't. And you show up for the one election where your vote is decided by, where the, the contest is decided by the Electoral College, but you don't show up for the little, the little state elections. And those are the ones that elect the people who send the electors to the Electoral Congress and, and the Electoral College. And, and so... 
what happens is is that you, we wind up shooting ourselves in the goddamn foot there. And, and you know, and, and people look at things that they, they say, well, I don't have any kids in school, so I don't need to show up for the, the school board elections. Well, you do, because those are the people who decide what we're teaching in local schools, whether you've got kids there or not. And where I live down well, here, man, I'll tell you, this is, you know, what were you going to say? Go ahead. Let me tell you, let me tell you, if you really want to know what we're dealing with, you got to go back to the 50s when uh, uh, the uh, father of the Koch brothers uh, uh, gave the uh, Robert Welch enough money to start the John Birch Society. And uh, most people are unfamiliar with the Blue Book and the Black Book, but I read them. And uh, uh, basically, uh, Robert Welch said, we're going to take over the school boards and determine what we teach children. We're going to take over the judges. We're going to start on the local level and we're going to take over the town councils. We're going to take over. And essentially, they were going to take over the Republican Party from the ground game up. And this is what they've been doing for 50. Now, when the John Birch Society fell into national ill repute, they changed their name and became the new Reich. And when that fell into national ill repute, they changed their name and became something else. But it is always the same group of people, the same ideology at work. We're going to take over. The only way to take over this country is to take over the uh, is to take over the mechanics at the bottom and work our way up, so that we have the ground game in place to get, uh, that when we get uh, on the president, we c we will have the mechanics there to put in this third right. Well, the fourth right, really. That's what they're. We, we got, after World War II, we got a lot of German businessmen who came over here and decided, well, really the problem was Hitler. Well, we could, but we really need a Reich. And so we just need someone who will not put us into a war because they were very happy in Germany because they, he built the Autobahn, he did this, he did that, he got rid of the unions. He says, if we could have avoided World War II, we would have had the Germany we want. Well, they're trying to do that here in America. It's taken right. them 50, 60 years, but that's their game plan. Right, and you got to, I don't know what they said. I mean, you, you, I, I sit here and I, I oh, this is the stuff that makes me insane. And uh, Brett, I, I see people that were former Republicans, prominent folks that now are anti-Trump. And, uh, and, and these cabinet... Uh, most of which you have rejected Trump and said, for God's sake, we know this guy, don't elect him. You know, it's super important. And, and that's great. Those are important messages. Don't get me wrong. But it's the folks on the left that say, these are our friends now. They're not your friends. They're not your friends. They're, they, they stand against every single thing you believe in. The only commonality that you have is they don't like Trump either. Okay? They want everything that that you stand against, but they know how bad Trump may, and they know what a disaster Trump will lead them to. Just like, you know, again, just like what you were talking about. If people, yeah, Germany would have been great if it wasn't for that goddamn Hitler guy. You know, Nazism would have worked out fine. And, and, and these are the same people that I, I constantly run into from the left and tell me how great communism would be if it wasn't for the damn communists. <laughs> these are the people that make you know. Hey, don't be wrong. Okay, be wrong. Sure, it's great when folks like John Kelly speak out against Trump. That's terrific. But make no mistake, this guy is a shithead from the from the get go, and he stands against everything you believe in. And so, while it's important that that he does speak out against his former boss, and that's great, these people are not your friends. They're not your allies. They happen to be going. To one temporarily but they're not going to vote for joe biden i can tell you that and they're going to do everything they can to continue to tear down everything that you believe in and oppress the people that you claim you care about that's that's their entire game plan you know and, and, and they just want a reagan they want somebody to put a charmy aw shucks good old boy face on it instead of some asshole like trump you know it's the same thing Exactly the same thing. So, well, you know what they're afraid of? What they're afraid of is another FDR. Because FDR, three and a half uh, terms, and he managed to erase all of their 
uh, political gains that they had done in the first, well, last half of the 19th century, first half of the 20th century, they had pretty much looted the economy. And FDR undid all of that. And, and JFK and LBJ did a pretty good job of stamping in uh, most of those programs. And we got, we got a lot of good work done. Uh, they have been trying to erase everything that uh, all the way back to Herbert Hoover. They want to erase everything that was accomplished since then so that they can, they want to have uh, the French aristocracy again, and they're going to be the, the aristocrats. That's their goal. Uh, and it doesn't matter what, what they call it. Uh, that Their goal is they want a working class of slaves. And I don't think they've even forgiven the union for abolishing slavery. Right. Well, I, I mean, I, I sat here yesterday and watched a group of Republicans on uh, on social media talking about how the worst thing that ever happened to America, as far as they were concerned, was the New Deal. And they, they need to stamp out the remnants of that. And, and what they really, of course, are talking about are uh, Social Security and, and Medicare. And, and again, you, you keep seeing these. And you, you see this, you know, first there was a little bit of rumbling here a couple of years ago. And, 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 and of course, we've been caught this since, again, Reagan, or, well, since it actually was founded, but um, or since those programs were started, where people are angry. You know, we, we, did, uh, we need to get rid of that Social Security and Medicare. The private sector can do this, yada, yada. I mean, you guys are familiar with all the arguments. And the truth of the matter is, is that it never works out that way. It, you know, uh, the... Uh, the private sector and uh, retirement funds are the trickle-down economics of Social Security and Medicare. They're, they're garbage. If if people could actually do those things for themselves, if business, if the private sector were capable of those things, we wouldn't have Social Security and Medicare in the first place because we wouldn't have needed it. The truth of the matter, and you see it around you, every the evidence is around you every day. Business will do Business's responsibility is to profit. That's what their responsibility is. That's what their goal is. That's what drives them is making goddamn money. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm saying that's the fact. And businesses, business nowadays, especially publicly held businesses, see their responsibilities to the shareholder and to nothing else. And that goes back to that goes back to Milton Friedman, the economist in the 90s, who said that yep. the purpose of business is to make a profit. And he right. was wrong. The person purpose of business is to provide a service to the consumer, uh, to the customer. And every businessman who forgets that he's in business to provide a service is is guilty of incorrect and inaccurate thinking. But that's why we have corporations that are so interested in the bottom line that we have planes crashing. Well, um, well, that's exactly. And you're Boeing exactly is the correct. perfect example. Yeah. Uh, but you're exactly correct. But again, you see this. You see this in our lifetime. The rise of the serial CEO. I mean, you talk. You listen to these people talk, and half of them don't even know. What they're, they're, these are these are assembly line MBAs who, when they talk about what their company does, they talk about product. The product. It could be baby food or jumbo jets doesn't make any difference to them because they're only there long enough to liquidate a couple of divisions, increase stockholder value and get their bonus and punch the hell out. They, they don't. Yeah, they there's don't, a guy. Right. There's a guy named Nathan Peltz who wants a couple of seats on the Disney board of directors and he's trying to buy his way in. And a lot of people who support Disney are saying, do not, you know, the election is April 3rd. And uh, I don't think he's going to win because so many people are against him. But he wants to he wants to take over Disney because he didn't, doesn't think Disney is making enough money. Now, well, well, you know, I'm not an expert on Disney's profit participation or profit situation, but I, I did meet Walt once and I followed Walt very closely in Walt's game. And the reason Walt was so successful is he was always thinking is how good can we make it? And he and Roy Disney used to have arguments because Walt would want to spend more money and Roy would say, we can't afford it. And Walt would find the money somewhere uh, and they would build the best they could, whether it was a movie or a, or a theme park or whatever. Uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is a good example. They spent $4 million on it. That was more money than had ever been spent on any movie in history at that point. But they made a movie that is timeless. And you go back, you look at it, and here you have Kirk Douglas and and Peter Laurie and and uh, and, and an incredible performance from uh, 
Captain Nemo, God, uh, uh, come on, come on, come on. I'm blanking out on his name. I can see his face. Anyway, um, uh, uh, you just have the incredible cast, incredible uh, special effects, and they reshot stuff that didn't work. Uh, the uh, giant squid stuff didn't work. They, they went and reshot it a different way. And Walt was willing to be, he was a perfectionist. It had to be just right. And, and now you have people who are looking at the product and saying, how do we make more money? And they're not thinking of what was, what did Walt want? What was, well, how do we live up to Walt's legacy? And, you know, whether Walt was a nice man or not is not the, uh, the, the question. The question is, how do we live up to Walt's legacy of providing the best possible experience for our customers? And there are people who have been in charge of Disney who have not understood that. And the, and the parks and the movies suffer. Uh, I don't know that Bob Iger is the solution, but he sure as hell is better than who's ever in second place right now. Uh, and we'll see. We'll, yeah. Yeah, and I don't so, like it. Yeah, I, but I that's a good example of the point. Yeah, that's the point <laughs> I wanted to make is they're, th they're thinking about money, not product. And they got, they got, you know, it's like over here, it's like uh, growing up, the Disney movies were, I, I couldn't get enough of them. I wanted more. Right. And now it's like, why did Disney release that? That's just a dreadful movie. Well, that's the thing, though. Like I said, I, and, and, we, and you and I have spoken about this. I, it's, it's, uh, you see this everywhere. You see, for example, I, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for example, is something I just find infuriating. It, it, it's don't get me wrong. There's some great acting in there. There's some of my favorite actors in the world in there. There have been some great. There have been some really outstanding movies, the Captain America movies, which are both fantastic. There have been some great performances, but there's no risk. They know that those movies are going to make money. There's a. They're not going to make anything new. There's, everything is a sequel to. What came before is the same story repackaged, told over and over again. It's the same characters. I mean, if it's got Scarlett Johansson in it, people are going to show up and see it. There's no risk to the goddamn thing. And yet, sci-fi and comic, if you consider comic book science fiction or not, whatever, fantasy, science fiction, comic book, there are literally, literally billions of stories, some of which are... Our, our, our timeless classics. I mean, some of the stuff from the you know the, the 50s and 60s and 70s that are, are Hugo Award-winning stories that are sitting there on a shelf somewhere that somebody optioned and then nobody will make a goddamn movie to the stuff that's being written right now. I, I mean, why God stuff is not on HBO is actually beyond me. These things are these things are safe. But, you know, they made Game of Thrones. And I saw that people would invest in this goddamn 10 year long, a decade long fantasy story with thousands of characters. And instead of saying, hey, let's find some other properties that are similar expanse, and they a pretty good example here, but a, a, a scope and, 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 and writing and those kind of things. Instead of doing that, they said, hey, We'll make another Game of Thrones, just set a couple of hundred years later, uh, and it's dragons and the same people and the same name, because because we're risk adverse on these kind of things, and that's not yeah. Same thing. thing uh, same thing. They went back to the Lord of the Rings. Uh, they did the Hobbit, which all right, uh, you know. But then they and now there's the Rings of Power on like, Amazon or Netflix. I forget who did that. But uh, and the thing is, sometimes they disrespect the original material. Don't ask me about the people who made uh, the Martian Child movie. It's like, it's that they just wanted the title. They didn't want. It's like, when it, yeah, at one point they said we want to change the title. I said, oh yeah, go ahead, change the title because it's not my story anymore. Um, but no, they said no. Martian Child's a great title. Yeah, all right, whatever. Um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's very Harlan Ellison there, and uh, what was it, uh, the Star Lost? <laughs> Oh he my God! Put, uh, put, what the hell? I forget what is his uh, like cord waiter bird or something is what he made him put on. Or they, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the thing is, they ran into executive meddling, uh, and the best story uh, I think is uh, Mel Brooks' company made uh, ha hired uh, uh, David Fincher to do um, not David Fincher, the other one, uh, the guy who did Eraserhead. Uh, they hired him to do uh, uh, the Elephant Man. And uh, they had 
they had a rough cut of it and they sent it upstairs to the executives at 20th. And the executives said, well, we would like these changes. And Mel Brook wrote them a very firm note saying, we didn't send right. it upstairs to, uh, for your notes. We sent up upstairs as a progress report only. And he, took, and, and he released the movie exactly as they had edited it and produced it. And of course, it, it got award nominations and made money and was a, uh, and is to this day is still considered an incredible success uh, in, in movie making that is, is, takes a stand for excellence as opposed to being another slice off the same old sausage. Uh, during the 40s, during the 30s and 40s, when the studios owned their own theater chains, they knew they had X number of films to put into the theaters every week. So they had their A pictures and their B pictures, and they put in a double bill, a cartoon, a newsreel, or whatever, and they owned their uh, distribution chain. In the 50s, the Supreme Court said that was a monopoly and that they divest themselves of their theater chains and the theater chains became independent. But also what happened was that was the end of the B picture. There was no, it was the end of the double feature and it was the end of the right. B picture. But the B pictures, you got, there was a, Warner's was doing the crime dramas and the noir films and MGM was doing the musicals and Universal was doing the monster movies because uh, they had that whole uh, assembly line where they had that particular franchise. Um, right. And that worked well enough because uh, you, you, know, you knew what you were gonna see in the movie theater. But nowadays for the studios to think of, oh, well, we made a, a, a half a billion dollars on this last one, let's make a sequel, Maybe we'll make 400 million on it and well, that'll be okay. And uh, what they didn't realize is with uh, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when they did Endgame, a lot of people like me said, okay, I'm done. I don't have to see anymore. They finished up this long story arc. And so a lot of their later movies is like, I don't have to go see it. I'm in, you know, I don't even know if I want to see it. The only ones that I've continued to follow are Spider-Man because I like Spider-Man. But other than that, uh, I have no great urge to uh, stay with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They reached a stopping point and I was done. Um, and I think that happened to them through their whole, there's a point at which you say, okay, we have to find something new. We cannot keep milking this cow, it's exhausted. Right. Well, I That's that, just me, what do I know about filmmaking? Right, and, 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 and the one, I mean, you and I are, are cut out of the same fabric and, uh, and we agree on a lot except for except for that last comment because I. I'm so goddamn sick of Spider-Man reboots. I could scream. But uh, anyway, uh, I, the reason I brought it up, though, originally was the fact that it, it's, a, it's a metaphor or a canary in the coal mine for larger things. I mean, this is America. You were, you, you were not getting the most advanced anymore, and that's very true. And that's because we Hollywood is a metaphor or a, a, uh, a bellwether for American business as a whole. We become risk adverse. We do the things that a good example is um, for those of you that follow me on Threads, for example, which is just you know it's it's uh, it's, it's Facebook one-liners and uh, you know it's supposed to be the alternative. It's not, especially recently because the, they've altered how their algorithm works so that it just keeps showing you more of the same shit. And if you there's you it it doesn't work. Is as crappy as Twitter has become. I mean, Musk has totally destroyed that platform. But where Twitter before Musk was useful, and don't get me wrong, that it was a crap platform to begin with because the previous asshole didn't know what the hell he was doing either. But at least it marked for seeing new information, for seeing new things, for, for, for connecting, making new connections, new neural connections in the global brain with, with other neurons maybe people that agreed with you or didn't agree with you but it was a way to see information new information threads is exactly the opposite of that threads is where you just keep seeing more of the same shit over and over again god help you if you click on somebody who's depressed or having because for the next month and a half threads is going to feed you nothing but depressed people who are having a bad day and it's it's not a it, and, and, and you look over at Twitter, which has been completely destroyed. Everything on there is right-wing nonsense. Everything on there is extremism. Uh, it, it, and if you're the kind of person who gravitates towards that kind of stuff, all it does is reinforce your outlook. There's no, there's no, it, it reinforces fanaticism and extremism. 
whereas I think threads reinforces depression and, and gloom. Well, um, what, what has happened is we have replaced broadcasting with narrow casting, that right. you now go to the websites and the news sites that reinforce your prejudices and your beliefs. Uh, back in the uh, 50s and the 60s, when news uh, was an important part of, uh, it was a responsibility on the radio and on television, right. you got a fairly uh, center of the road reporting. Uh, even the right wing uh, reporters like uh, George Putnam in LA were still doing their uh, a pretty good job of reporting things as accurately as they could despite their right. personal spin. But now you don't have to listen to news that's objective. You can go, or tries to be objective, you go to the subjective news that agrees with you. And that is part of the problem. Right. And it began with uh, uh, Reagan repealing the Equal uh, Access Act. And, and then uh, Reagan made it possible for Rupert Murdoch to come into this country. Uh, he gave him all kinds of special privileges. And next thing, we had Fox News. And Fox News went around to all of the, the uh, uh, it says, we'll put the, you know a monitor up with Fox News on it. And uh, in your uh, waiting room and in your restaurant and in your bar. And then they went around to the local stations and they said, uh, we know you have, uh, it's expensive for you to put uh, uh, all of this stuff. We'll provide you with free programming and we'll provide the commercials for it. And so that's why Rush Limbaugh had a national audience practically overnight. That's why Fox News dominated. And, and that was a deliberate plan to create a right wing uh, uh, conservative movement in this country to move the Overton window. That's the, the context for the culture to move that window rightward. And uh, they were very effective at that. You got to give them uh, points that that was a great plan that they had imagined from the beginning that they were going to demonize Democrats. And now people think Democrats are the enemy, liberals are the enemy, and absolutely have to be stopped at all costs because God knows they want to give us health care and, and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and other things. I love most of them. Hey, uh, we're, uh, I'm watching the, uh, the comments here and yeah, I know what time it is. In fact, I got to get going cause I've got, uh, I've got, uh, stuff in the oven and I've got to go take care of. Uh, I'm going to have to punch out and wish everybody a happy Easter or a happy transgender visibility day or a happy Bunsen burner day or whatever the hell it is. And it literally happy is Sunday. It actually is uh, Bunsen burner awareness. Day. It's also um, the end of Ramadan. So have a, have, right. so I hope you had a blessed Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak. So but whatever day, whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate, hope you have a great day, but I got to get rolling. So okay, Jim and, uh, David. Yeah. Hi, it's me. Remember me. <laughs> oh, uh, oh uh, Bob, were you here? <laughs> you hear Bob? Oh, sort of, but I did want to say thank you guys for giving up part of your Easter. And uh, one kind of note on giving up a little bit of stuff. If the CEO of Boeing said he's going to resign by the end of the year, I think he ought to buck it forward and maybe save the tax, save the people $15.6 million for that year's salary he wants to draw while he's waiting to leave. Now, I got that off my chest. It's, um, it's, funny, it's funny that he announced his resignation because I was thinking, you know, it, it, that uh, I would like uh, 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 President Biden to get on the phone and say, it's time for you to go. Because if you don't, there's going to be, I'm going to sick the Department of Justice on you. Um, and yeah, they uh, should. But now, and, and, uh, and then the next day he offered his resignation. So I don't know who, who got it, who held a gun to his head and got him to go, but uh, he had to. Well, I think getting to keep the $15.6 million annual salary. Yeah, for the year, gotta, oh, yeah, I'd resign, I'd resign for that much money too. Uh, so. now, but there's a couple other things I want to get before I lose you guys. Uh, thank you so much for giving up a uh, part of your Easter morning for us. And also, in about a month, the next time you see David on this podcast, uh, he should be uh, reminding you that he's got a, we have a new book out at BQ Press called Madam President, of which he is the uh, title author. And uh, uh, he's got uh, your, the name of your story is uh, War Zone. Right, right. That was a fun story to write because it has a very nice twist. It is incredible to write and fun to edit, and uh, and it's uh, looking forward to it because uh, 
we're about to send out paid proof <coughs> contracts and checks. Um, so uh, that's always a fun thing to do as a publisher. But thank you both. And uh, uh, I'm just glad you're here. And uh, Well, thank you. It's always fun to do these last Sunday.